Thank you, Vaughn. Appreciate that very much. Wonderful, wonderful song. Good afternoon. Very happy to see all of you. Welcome you to this camp meeting. We hope you are being blessed as we study the book of Daniel. No, I am not too old to be able to kneel before my Lord and Savior, so I'm going to kneel and pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Lord and Savior, we come to Thee this afternoon asking that You will give us the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to surrender our hearts to You and ask that You will give us wisdom, give us understanding, Help us to see and to know what you have revealed that we might walk as you have directed and led. Bless each one here, those that are watching by television, those that are listening on the radio or on the internet, Lord. May they be blessed in a special way as well. Keep us each close to you, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful hope that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. This we pray in his name. Amen. The book of Daniel evenly divides into two parts. The first six chapters of the book of Daniel are historical. They talk about Babylon. They talk about God's people in Babylon. They are wonderful stories about how his people were tested and how they stood firm for the word of God. Talks about the conversion of a pagan king and what took place in his life and how they influenced him. All these are historical statements in the book of Daniel and that's what the first six chapters deal with. Second chapter has some prophetic parts in it as you have just studied. But it's with the seventh chapter and thereon that deals with the prophetic aspect of Daniel. From that point on, you have visions that were given to Daniel and what he was told by God, and those take you step by step through a template. If you please, a template that God laid down that covers from Daniel's day to the coming of Christ. That's what those six chapters cover, from Daniel's day to the coming of Christ. Very, very important that you and I understand that template. And if we understand that template, then we will know exactly what is happening and what's going to take place. That's the reason God gave it is so that we could understand what is happening. We have to be very, very careful not to superimpose upon that template, to superimpose some method of biblical interpretation. We should not do that. We need to take what God's Word says and understand what it's saying and follow it, not having some preconceived idea of what it should do. And so we need to be careful that we don't permit that to happen. So what we're going to do here this afternoon is we're going to take a look at the seventh chapter and we're going to see how God has laid out how things are to take place. They will hold true all the way through the book of Daniel. They will hold true all the way through the book of Revelation. And so you and I, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, do not have to be in doubt as to what is going to happen, what's going to take place. We know what the Scripture tells us is going to happen. So Daniel starts right out. In the beginning, we're going to go to the second verse. The second verse there of Daniel, and it just simply say, says this. If you have your Bible, you're going to have to get my to work. It doesn't seem to work. Daniel, the 
second chapter, and we'll take a look at uh, verse 2. Okay, and it says, And Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Daniel starts out by using biblical symbolism. It uses biblical symbolism, and sorry that we're having trouble here. You always worry whether this is going to work or not. Biblical symbolism God uses all the way through the Bible, and those symbols hold true all the way through Scripture that you and I can know what God is telling us and what is taking place. So here, as we look at Daniel, he talks about certain symbols. Let's go on to the next verse. And it says, maybe we could see the next verse. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, that isn't right. It jumped, so let's back up. It says, he saw the wind blowing on the waters. Okay? In Bible prophecy, we're told clearly that water represents people, nations, and tongues. Revelation, the 15th chapter, verse 17, or verse 17th chapter, verse 15, tells us that water represents people, nations, and tongues. So we find that when he sees the wind blowing on the waters, it's talking about people. What's going to take place there? Wind, we find in, in Revelation, the 7th chapter, and verse 1, it tells us that wind represents war, represents strife, so forth. And so these represent war, strife among the people. And as the result of that, we're told that four great beasts came up out of the sea. So we'll see if the next text will come up for us here. Okay? Anyhow, it says that that was to take place. So among those four beasts, the Scripture doesn't leave us in any doubt. If you have your Bible, you want to go to Daniel 7 and verse 17. It tells you clearly that these four beasts are four kings that shall arise out of the earth. So the Scripture does not leave us in any question as to who these beasts are. It tells us they are four kings that will rise up out of the earth. So we have those clearly there in Scripture. So let's take a look at the first one. We begin to see what it's talking about when we're talking about the first beast. And the first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. A man's heart was given to it. So the first beast is like a lion. This beast, of all the beasts that are pictured, it's the only one that a man's heart is given to. Okay? And the reason a man's heart is given to it is because of the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar. That's the reason it says that a man's heart was given to this particular beast. Rose up on its two hind feet. This represented the kingdom of Babylon. As you read, as you just studied in Daniel 2, God said, Thou art this head of gold. So the King Nebuchadnezzar. If we take a look at Babylon, Babylon was a marvelous city. Nebuchadnezzar was a fantastic general. Uh, He never lost a battle. And he took all the spoils that he had from campaign after campaign and poured it on the city of Babylon. And so this city became known as the Golden Kingdom. And there was tremendous uh, wealth in the city of Babylon. If you took a look or you walked into the city of Babylon, you went through something called the Ishtar Gate that opened into the city of Babylon. This is a very, very famous gate. And when you went into there, uh, you can see. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this Ishtar Gate. Germany. Germany went into 
Babylon, the ruins of Babylon, and excavated. And they took the Ishtar gate and they took it down, clay tablet after clay tile, off the walls. They took them off and numbered them. Took them each one and numbered them. And then they brought all that back to Germany. And you can go to one of the museums there, the Pergamus Museum in Berlin, and they have rebuilt the Ishtar gates. That's what you saw. That picture was the actual picture of the Ishtar gate. So it begins to give you some idea of the glory uh, of this kingdom that he had built. It was, it was a fantastic kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar had built, and it was his desire, as you found out, that it would never end that it would go on and on and on. Jeremiah talked about Babylon, and here, Jeremiah, the fourth chapter in verse 7, he said, The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land. This was a coalition Cyrus, great, great leader, and overcame Babylon. He and his men went up and they surrounded the city of Babylon. We're told that the people went up on top of the wall and threw food to him and laughed at him. He took his men and they marched down the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River flowed right through Babylon, the city of Babylon. They marched down the Euphrates River and a selected place they began to dig canals and they diverted the river Euphrates into those canals. And then he and his men marched up the muddy bottom of the Euphrates River. They marched up there and inside the city it had been the gates had been left open. They had been predicted by Scripture in Isaiah 45, verse 1. It said that the two-leaved gates would be left open. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed desires, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the army of kings, to open for him the double doors, so that the gates shall not be shut. And just exactly as said, those gates were left open. He and his men marched into the city of Babylon and took it. Belshazzar, who was the king at that time, the grandson, if you please, of Nebuchadnezzar, was ruling. And it says that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Darius the Mede received the kingdom of about 62 years old. So Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon. Medo-Persia ruled from 539 to 331 B.C. This is the time that she ruled. A uh, strong kingdom and did a lot of things that uh, took, took care of a place. This is the time in which Esther is involved in all in your Bible. Okay? But after that, we come to a third beast. In Daniel 7, verse 6, it says, After this I looked... And there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. This is the kingdom of Greece. And by the way, folks, when I'm talking about a template, God is laying down a template here. 
And God is so, how should I put it, so desirous that you understand that template and what's taking place is that he even calls these nations by name so that you don't have to be in doubt. He's not asking you, uh, guess what this is. In Daniel the 8th chapter, he calls them by name so you can know exactly what's there. And this is Alexander the Great, the kingdom of Greece. Alexander, at a young age, took over the army from his father and began to march those men and to take, them, take one kingdom after another. In fact, Alexander marched that army for seven years without ever going home. Marched them clear to the borders of India. Took everything he could lay his hands on. One historian said this about Alexander the Great. I am persuaded there is no nation where his name did not reach. There seems to be some divine hand presiding over his birth and his actions. And how true that was. Wept because there was nothing else to conquer. Driving at the borders of the country of India, his men refused to go any farther. Turning, they headed back home. Coming to the city of Babylon, Alexander the Great is lying on a table in that very hall where the hand had written many, many tickle you farson. He's lying on a table there dying, suffering from epilepsy, from drunkenness, debauchery. His four generals come in. And they said to him, to who will you give the kingdom? And he said, I'll give my kingdom to the strongest. And so when he died, his kingdom was divided among his four generals. That's why that leopard beast had four heads. It also had four wings, which represented the swiftness with which Alexander the Great took everything that was before him. Greece ruled from 300. 131 B.C. to 168 B.C. Now we come to the fourth kingdom. Daniel 7 and verse 7, and it says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling its, the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. This beast is not like any of the others. It's a nondescript dragon. And it's taken everything before it. And this represented the nation of Rome, pagan Rome. In 68 BC. Rome was different. Rome was different than any of the nations before it, and they just simply moved in and took over one part of the country after another until they had great masses of the country. But there's something that happens here, folks. Rome not only came in and took over these areas, but they brought civilization to these nations. Rome is the one who made the roadways safe. They made the waterways safe. Roman soldiers marched down the road carrying pa standards that said Pac Romana, which meant Roman peace. Now that may not sound significant to you, but that is tremendously important because that's what opened the way for Christianity to be preached. Up until that time, basically impossible. But with Rome making the way safe for travel, those apostles and all could go anywhere they wanted to and preach the gospel. And that's what they did. So Rome made that possible. But Rome uh, was brutal. 
It had great iron teeth. And it ruled with an iron hand. You can remember it was Herod under Rome that had the children in Bethlehem killed. It was Roman soldiers that crucified Jesus. The stuck spear into his side. Rome ruled from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Rome ruled during this time. Now, we've been following pretty much at what Daniel 2 says. When we get to the seventh verse, it says that this beast was di different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. All of a sudden, this beast, who is nondescript and all, also has ten horns. Those ten horns represented the ten Germanic tribes that came down and ran over the Roman Empire. They were known as Goths. They were Germanic people. And they were made up of tribes such as the Hurlii, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Alamani, and so forth. These became the nations of Western Europe, the ten kings, as it refers to, the ten kings that ruled at that time. Those nations became the nations, the Anglo-Saxons became the English, the Franks became the French, the Alamani became the Germans, and they became the nations of, these, uh, of Western Europe today. Now this becomes important because as you continue to study scripture and you move into the book of Revelation, you're going to find that there's, it carries right on through. Like I told you, we're laying down a template and it'll all fit within that template, folks. And so you and I need to follow it very, very careful. Now, we come to another part all of a sudden that comes up, and by the way, this is all Rome. Do you understand me? We're going to take a look at what in Scripture is referred to as the little horn. Okay? But the little horn comes up out of... Huh? Out of Rome. So it doesn't matter what you're talking about, it's still Rome... And it's Rome all the way through. And we'll take a look at that as we go through. So the scripture describes this little horn with these words. Give us another slide. It says, And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, or a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So now we have this little horn rising. Uh, he's different than the others. Uh, he does certain things. God does not intend for you to have any doubts as to who this little horn is. I want you to understand that. No, God does not intend for you to have any doubts about it. Uh, in fact... He will give you uh, identification or give you one point after another that will identify this little horn. goes on and says here in verse 24, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from the kingdom. Another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, shall subdue three kings. So it says, and he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times of laws. Then the saints shall be given to his hand for a time, times, and a dividing of time. God there gives you eight points of identification. Now, folks, I had a couple little girls come up here on the platform before we started. And they said, can we ask you a personal question? And I said, yes. They said, how old are you? <laughs> now, and uh, and, and I, so I told them how old I was. And they said, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, 
I've been preaching a long time, folks. And I've been preaching the prophecies a long time. And I have told people this over and over and over. If you can take those eight points that God gives and you can make it fit any other power on the face of the earth, come and see me. I'll listen to everything you have to say. That This is the only power that it will fit. So what I'm trying to say is God is tying it down so you and I don't have to be in doubt. We can know exactly what is taking place and where we are in regard to this, this particular power. So God gives you eight points to identify it. And you'll find that it puts that all together for you. The first one, it says, would be among them. All right. Uh, this is what the first clue is. That it would be among them. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Next picture. Okay. And it says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom. Another shall rise after them. If you look at verse 8, Daniel 7 and verse 8, it says another would rise among them. That's what it says, would rise among them. Therefore, I don't have to go off to Africa looking where this is to come up. Or I don't have to go to South America. Or I don't even have to go to the United States. The scripture is absolutely clear that it was going to come up among those ten horns. And if it's going to come up among those ten horns, then that tells me clearly that it had to come up in Western Europe. That's where it has to rise. So we don't have to be in doubt as to where it's to be. It had to come up out of Western Europe. It would rise among them. The second point that the Scripture gives, it says, and another shall rise after them. came down and ran over the Roman Empire and basically brought an end to it in 476 A.D. Therefore, this little horn had to come on the scene of action after 476 A.D. That's what it's saying. Another would rise after them. He has to come on the scene of action after 476 A.D. Lots of things are happening at this time, folks. The nation, the whole power, uh, kingdom is being upset and all. Justinian is the emperor. And Justinian is trying to keep his empire together. And he's doing everything that he can. And so he feels like that if he can take and make the bishop of Rome put him in power. I I'm sure that Justinian never saw Virgilius as anything other than a puppet, that he would do what Justinian wanted to do. And so we read here in history, it says, for Gillis ascended the papal chair, five what? 538 A.D. Mark it down, put it down, it's an important date. Under the military protection of Belsarius. And so, Virgilius ascended the papal chair, History tells us that's not what happened. History tells us that the Bishop of Rome stepped to the seat of Caesar and seized the scepter. So you have a complete change taking place there. Not necessarily because, should I say, that he sought it. I don't know that he sought it, but he didn't do anything to stop it. But... A, a change began to take place. It says here, the third point, he shall be different from the first. These ten Germanic tribes were strictly, strictly pagan powers. Civil powers, that's all they were. But now, all of a sudden, we have a change taking place. Listen to this statement. The Bishop of Rome, in the seat of Caesar was now the greatest man in the West and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world, Rome was still 
the political capital. Hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride, sense of glory, and every social prejudice flavored the evolution of the great city in the ecclesiastical capital. Civil as well as religious disputes were referred to the successor of Peter for settlement. And I don't know if you caught what that is saying, but it's saying that he basically was forced not only to be the religious head, but the civil head of government. And so all of a sudden we find church and state being put together, different different than all the others that were before it. And thus we find all of a sudden, I, I hope you understand, folks, that church, I don't care which church it is, church has no civil power. Church doesn't have civil power. It has to turn to civil government its power. That's what has to happen. And that's what happens in the last days when a church turns to civil government to have its power. And that's what you had here in 538 AD. By the way, I don't have anything up here on it, but I have the quotes and stuff. In 538 AD, do you know what ha also happened? I mean, he not only became the political as well as the religious head. But you know what else happened? They enforced a Sunday law. 538 A.D. They enforced a Sunday law at that time. So you find that definitely a change took place. It was different than from all the others before it. It says that it would subdue three kings. As these Germanic people, the Franks, the Herliai, the Vandal, the Ostrogoths, and all these people came down on the Roman Empire and began to break it apart, the Christians that lived in the Roman Empire saw this as an opportunity to share the gospel. And to their surprise, they found these people with open hearts. And so as they preached, Jesus Christ to these people, they accepted it. And that's why today, Western Europe is basically Christian in concept. It's because they went in and they brought Christianity to it, and they reached out and accepted Christianity. But among those that accepted it, there were three tribes that didn't go along with what the papal power was preaching. And under Justinian, under the Pope of Rome, they went in and they annihilated, if you please, three tribes, the Herliai, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And by the way, it says it would uproot them. That's what it says. And you can go, if you want to go and check it out, you can find that to the Anglo-Saxons, their Descendants are who? The English. To the Franks? The French. Alamani? Germans. But you cannot find any descendants to the Herliai, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. It said it would uproot them, and that's exactly what it did. Also, it says that this power would speak pompous words against the Most High. Uh, another word for pompous would be blasphemy. Would speak blasphemous words against the Most High. The Bible defines blasphemy as when one attributes to himself the prerogatives of God. In other words, if I claim to be God or if I claim to have the power of God, in the scripture, that is blasphemy. Now, all I can do in this case is let them tell you what they say. These are a couple statements. It says, For thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husband, 
Finally, thou art another God on earth. In other words, saying they're the same as God on earth. Another statement says, Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as the king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Another one says, We the Pope, great encyclical letter, We the Pope hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Those are pompous words in my books, folks. So when it says he would speak pompous words, he has done just that. Shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Uh, you have to find a power that has made war with God's people. And uh, history tells us that that's exactly what took place. This is a statement from Encyclopedia, Wikipedia says, in the medieval period, the Roman Catholic Church moved to suppress the Cathar heresy, the Pope having sanctioned a crusade against the Abigenses, during the course of which the massacre of over a 20-year period, this campaign an estimated 200,000 to 1 million people were killed. Uh, numbers unbelievable of the people that died that they made war. John Huss, a Bohemian preacher of Reformation, was burned at the stake on the 6th July, 1415. Pope Martin V issued a bull on 17 March, 1420, which proclaimed a crusade for the destruction of the Wycliffe Lights, the Hussites, and all other heretics in Bohemia. And so, indeed, she did just that. She made war against the people of God. Well, we've looked at six of them. Seven. And shall intend to change times and laws says this power would endeavor to change times of law. They make no bones about it. They make it very clear that they believe they have this power. Listen to this statement. The Pope has power to change times, abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. says that he has that power to do that. And so the Bible lays it out very clear for us. It just sent, said that he would have power to do this, did they? Well, if you pick up your Bible, turn to Exodus, the 20th chapter, there you have the Ten Commandments. I don't care which Bible you pick up in Exodus, the 20th chapter, you'll find the Ten Commandments. But when you pick up a Catholic catechism, that whole thing changes. You'll find that the Second Commandment has been a done away with completely. It's not there. The Fourth Commandment has been shortened from 96 words to 8 words and has been moved to the third. And the tenth commandment has been divided into two, so they still have ten commandments. So yes, they have changed times, and they have changed laws. It says, then the saint shall be given to his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. The Bible, folks, I marvel at how clear and how accurate God's Word is. I mean, over and over he puts it there so that you and I don't have any question in knowing what it's talking about. So when it says that it be given into his hands in the Bible, a time simply represents one year, 360 days, or times represents two years, 720 days. A half a time represents a half a year, or 180 days, totaling that up, it comes to 1,260. Okay, we're told in Scripture, in Ezekiel 4 and verse 6, it simply says, I have laid on you a day for a year. Numbers 14, 34 says, I've given you a day for a year. And I have people ask me, well, how do you know that's right? Uh, I have a very simple answer for that. It works. <laughs> it works. And so, yes. So I told you that Virgius ste stepped to the seat of Caesar in 538 A.D., the papal power. 
came to power. If I add 1260 years to that, that takes me to the date of 1798. That was the time that was given to papal Rome. Okay? That's how much time was given to them. All right. At the end of that 1260 years, something had to happen. Napoleon had come to power. Napoleon wants to rule Europe. Knows he cannot do it unless he breaks the back of the papal power. So we read in the American Encyclopedia, in 17, when? 1798, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, established a secular one. And thus, papal Rome came to an end, as the scripture said. Now, folks, God has laid down a template. Let me tell you, that template stays that way all the way through. It doesn't change, folks. And when people start putting other nations in in place of these, they just mess it up. That's what they do. Now, I want to share something with you in closing. I hope that you will get what I'm trying to get across to you. The Scripture is trying to get across to you. This is what it says. Look at Daniel 7th chapter, verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Talking about the little horn, right? The little horn came to its end when? Huh? In 1798, it came to its end, right? Okay, look at what it says here. That's Daniel 7, verse 8. Look what Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10 says. I watched till the thrones were put in place and the ancient days was seated. The court was seated and the books were open. What is that telling you? That's telling you that when 1798 came, the papal power fell, and the next thing would be the judgment. Investigative judgment would be the very next thing on the list. He's giving you a template. He says, this is what's going to happen next. Now watch. That was Daniel 7, verse 8, 9, and 10. Look at verse 14. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and his kingdom, the one sh which shall not be destroyed. It says that after the judgment, what comes? Huh? God's kingdom. So that's the next thing that's to come is God's kingdom after that. God takes it and he drives it in the ground, folks. Drives it in the ground trying to get you and I to say, yes, I understand. Go to Daniel 7, 21. I was watching in the same horn making war against the saints and prevailing against them. This is what he's talking about. Watch what happens, what comes next. We're still in verse 22, Daniel 7, 21. Now verse 22. Until the ancient days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. What's that? That's the judgment. He's going through the same thing with you, saying when papal Rome comes to an end, 1798, the next thing will be the judgment. And after the judgment, verse 22, and the time came for the saints to... Possess the kingdom. The time what? Came for the saints to possess the kingdom. The time has come for the saints to possess the kingdom. Are you getting it? Where do you think you are in the judgment? The time has come for the saints to possess the kingdom. We're down at the end. Look, he doesn't even stop there. He does it again. Daniel 7:24. And another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first. Still talking about the little horn. Okay. Then after that it says, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. When did they take away the dominion from the little horn? 1798. Then what's going to happen? The judgment. And then verse 27 says, Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people and the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. That God is going to come, and he's going to set up his kingdom. I, I don't know. 
what to tell you. That you and I have the privilege of living at this time. You're living at the time when God is going to set up his kingdom. The time has come for the saints to possess the kingdom. Dear friend, you and I should be daily, daily pleading with God, pleading with God to make us kind, to make us gentle, to make us loving, to make us like our Savior. This is what the world needs. They need to see Jesus in you. This is what the world's lacking. Therefore, you and I need to give hearts daily to the Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Stay close to Jesus Christ. Walk with him each day. Thank you.